Hello there guys. Seeing as how my last Herodotus Book Club video went, I wanted to do a bit of a sequel to it, and who knows, maybe it'll be a limited series. In the last video, we discovered that the ancient Greek historian's claims about the Twin Pyramids of Egypt were, uh, kind of right, but also mostly wrong. Today, I wanted to examine another claim of his, also, uh, coincidentally about ancient Egypt, that of the legendary pharaoh, Sisistrisis. On the same exact 5th century vacation in which he saw the Twin Pyramids, Herodotus stood in a grand temple within the ancient city of Memphis. During his visit, Herodotus spoke in detail with a couple of temple priests. According to him, these priests belonged to the god Hephaestus. In reality, it was likely the Egyptian god Ta. In any case, the Greek traveler quizzed them on everything they knew about the land of Egypt's history. Because, according to Herodotus, the Egyptians keep better records than anyone else I have ever come across or questioned. From the priests and the scrolls recorded in their library, Herodotus learned that Egypt had stood for at least 15,000 years. They spoke of their countless kings and rulers over those centuries, more than 330. From Min, the legendary founder of Egypt, to the 18 foreign Ethiopians who once ruled the land, to the single female pharaoh, Herodotus is very scant with the details concerning their reigns because, according to him, none achieved a thing of note. But not all the kings were unremarkable. Herodotus found room in his book to describe the achievements of one king in particular, the greatest among them all, Sisistrisis. Herodotus's account of him goes as follows. None of the other kings, though, achieved a thing so let me pass over them and commemorate instead their successor, a king by the name of Sisistrisis. The first thing he did, so the priests informed me, was to set sail for the Arabian Gulf with a fleet of warships, and then to cruise along the coast of the Red Sea, subduing all who lived there, until, in due course, he came to a stretch of water so shallow that it was no longer navigable. Sisistrisis duly returned to Egypt, whereupon he assembled a large army and swept across the mainland, subduing every nation in his path. He crossed from Asia into Europe and conquered the Scythians and the Thracians. This, I think, constituted the limit of the Egyptian army's advance. Sisistrisis wheeled around and headed back. Following his military campaigns, the pharaoh returned back to Egypt to manage the affairs of his homeland, but Sisistrisis's military ambitions were not over. Herodotus goes on to say that Sisistrisis was the only Egyptian king to rule Ethiopia. And we are told that wherever this Sisistrisis conquered, he left monuments to his greatness. Wherever he happened to meet with a people of particular valor, ferocious in the defense of their liberty, he would erect a number of pillars in their land, on which were inscribed a record of his own name in fatherland together with an assertion that it was through his own personal might that he had vanquished them. To the peoples whose cities he had conquered easily, without so much as a fight, the same pillars would be raised and inscribed with the very same message as given to the peoples who had shown themselves true men. But with this one addition, a woman's genitals. That's right, he left giant pillars that were basically glorified Chad versus Soyjack memes. Herodotus himself, thousands of years later, encountered some of these pillars while traveling the world. He says that, Most of the pillars which King Sisistrisis of Egypt raised in the various lands he conquered no longer seem to be standing. But in Palestinian Syria, I did see for myself that there were some still in existence, complete with the inscriptions I mentioned earlier, and the woman's genitals. In addition, in Ionia, there are two figures of a man carved into the rock, one on the road from Ephesus to Phocia, and the other between Sardis and Smyrna. In both places, the carvings which stand seven feet high show a man with a spear in his right hand and a bow and arrows in his left, carved across his chest, running from shoulder to shoulder, and written in Egyptian hieroglyphs are these words. It was upon my shoulders that the winning of this land was born. Herodotus also reports that similar pillars and stone monuments were seen standing as far as Scythia and Thrace. Relics littered across the known world, like something out of a post-apocalyptic landscape. 
Herodotus' description of Pharaoh Sisistrisus' reign can only be appreciated when we look at a map. Herodotus phrases it nonchalantly, but when you really think about it, what he is saying is insane. This pharaoh apparently conquered a domain that consisted of the coast of the Arabian Peninsula along the Red Sea, Syria-Palestine, Anatolia, Thrace, Scythia, Colchis, and then down into Ethiopia, a massive, massive amount of territory. Herodotus's details are very hazy and vague, so we don't know exactly the extent of this great domain, but conservatively, it would have been 2,000 miles long from end to end. There is also the fact that an Egyptian pharaoh was conquering Europe, leading an entire army from atop a golden chariot through the snowy mountains of Romania. I bet he was so freaking cold, just look at him. The conquest of Sisistrisus would have turned Egypt into an empire, unlike any the world had ever seen before, or would see again until the likes of the Persians and Alexander the Great. Oh yeah, he also helped invent geometry apparently. Herodotus says that, Sisistrisus divided the country up into square plots of equal size, then raised revenues from this reform by ordering every plot holder to pay an annual tax. Whenever a man's land was lost due to the rising river waters, inspectors would be sent out to measure the precise extent of the man's loss, so that his future tax rate could be set at a level appropriate to the reduced size of his holding. It is my theory that this was what lay behind the discovery of geometry, and its subsequent importation into Greece. Blame this freaking guy for making us learn sine, cosine, and tangent. The great Sisistrisus' achievements, unfortunately, did not last. Herodotus states that after dying of advanced age, he was succeeded by his blind and generally weak son named Pharaon. It can be theorized that much of, if not the majority, of these territorial gains were lost under this new pharaoh's rule, as Egypt shrunk back to its more traditional size along the Nile River. But the impact of Sisistrisus' brief empire continued long after his death. Not only did many of his Egyptian victory pillars remain standing in distant lands for hundreds, if not thousands of years, but Herodotus claims the Colchians of Colchis along the Black Sea were descended from men in Sisistrisus' army. Now, what are we to make of Sisistrisus? the pharaoh that conquered much of the known world. His description reads almost as an alternate history of Egypt, where it became an empire, a superpower instead of just a regional kingdom. It sounds too fascinating and weird to be true, right? And Herodotus has demonstrated that he had a tendency to exaggerate and get duped. The events he described, even in his own day, were likely over a thousand years past. But to his credit, he had some evidence that corroborated this amazing story told to him by the Egyptian priests. Who was Sisistrisus? This is a question many historians have sought in vain to answer. Identifying pharaohs mentioned in sources from outside Egypt and trying to link them with pharaohs mentioned in Egypt is harder than you'd think. There were roughly 33 different dynasties that ruled Egypt over its 3,000 year long history. Among these dynasties, mainstream archaeology has identified more than 170 known pharaohs, a list that has been compiled from monuments, inscriptions, pottery, scrolls, and graffiti. From famous ones like Ramses II and Cleopatra, to obscure ones such as those known simply as finger snail, the elephant, fish, and just the letter A. Egypt has existed as a civilization for an insane amount of time, and the sheer number of different rulers it has had reflects this to the point things become murky. These pharaohs, described in native sources, do not always correspond well with those found in accounts written by visitors. The Sisistrisus mentioned by Herodotus the Greek is definitely one of the more problematic. Just like the unnamed pharaoh mentioned in the biblical book of Exodus, we are in a difficult predicament trying to identify him. For one thing, the name of the pharaoh, Sisistrisus, is not Egyptian. It is a Greek rendering of an Egyptian name. This is an important distinction to make. Herodotus heard an Egyptian name spoken by the priests and transliterated it into his own language, no doubt changing some of the original vowels and sounds in the process. If you notice, Herodotus' ignorance of the Egyptian language is made pretty clear when he speaks of Sisistrisus' son, Pharaon or Pharos. 
This is almost definitely a mistake on our Greeks' part, as it appears that Herodotus erroneously thought the word pharaoh was an individual person's name rather than a royal title. If a real Sisistrisis existed, his name was probably not Sisistrisis. The name Herodotus wrote down in his book is most likely a corruption of the real Egyptian name Sinisaret, a name shared by several pharaohs, but it is impossible to say for certain. It is also possible that Sisistrisis, or the original uncorrupted name, was just a less common nickname for a pharaoh we do know, just like how we call some of the Roman emperors Caligula or Elagabalus when these were not their real names. A huge problem with that theory is the fact that the details Herodotus gives of Sisistrisis' life don't exactly match up with any known pharaoh. Historians have proposed a whole score of possible candidate pharaohs for Sisistrisis, from Sinisaret I and II, to Seti I, to Ramses II, but none of them quite work. It is pretty universally understood that the pharaohs of the 18th and 19th dynasties were the greatest conquerors Egypt ever had, so presumably Sisistrisis belonged to one of these dynasties. Ramses II, third ruler of the 19th, was one of the greatest, but his domains were nowhere near Sisistrisis' level of achievements. As far as we know, no pharaoh fully established control over the Red Sea, or the coast of Arabia, until the Ptolemies, who ruled Egypt over a hundred years after Herodotus' book. Elsewhere, debatably only three pharaohs, Tutmos III, Amenhotep II, and Necto II, are ever recorded as crossing beyond the Euphrates River, and when they did so, they did not go far, nor did they stay long. As far as the records tell us, none went into Asia Minor, or so much as touched any part of Europe. Furthermore, at the time Sisistrisis was supposed to exist, Anatolia was the heart of the Hittite Empire, the main rival to the Egyptians. These Hittites would block any such pharaoh's military campaigns. In fact, this is exactly what happened. Both Hittite and Egyptian sources agree that the empire successfully defended their borders from their southern neighbors' incursions. Egypt got nowhere near the locations where Herodotus claims Sisistrisis carved his monuments. Unfortunately, almost everything the Greek says about Sisistrisis does not mesh well with what we currently know about Egypt's history. It is as if Sisistrisis in his continent-crossing Egyptian empire was conjured from thin air. No trace or evidence of it has ever been found. To make things worse, even in antiquity, we know that some question the reliability of Herodotus' original account. The Greek historian Diodorus of Sicily, writing 400 years after Herodotus, states, With regard to this king, not only are the Greek writers at variance with one another, but also among the Egyptians, the priests and the poets who sing his praises, give conflicting stories. That is to say, there was no consistent story told about this pharaoh, even among the Egyptians themselves, 2,000 years ago. If only we could find one of those monuments, the ones Herodotus himself claimed to have seen and viewed as definitive proof of the tales. If we found just one, it might settle everything for good and all. Oh well, it has been over two millennia. It might be too good to hope that they survived such a long time. Wait, wait, we found one of them? In modern day Turkey, there is a road connecting the two ancient cities of Sardis and Ephesus. It takes you through a rocky and mountainous terrain known as the Karabel Pass. On the southern slope of one of the mountains in the pass, you will find a carved stone relief, one and a half meters wide and 2.5 meters tall. It is badly worn by centuries of erosion, but certain shapes can still be seen clearly. A man wearing a conical hat and grasping a bow in one hand and a spear in the other. Even more faintly engraved in the rock are a smattering of ancient symbols just to the right of his head. This relief is known as Carabel A. It is the sole survivor of several monumental carvings that once decorated this region. The others were sadly destroyed during the construction of the modern road. Watchers with a good memory might find something oddly familiar about this relief. It appears to match pretty dang closely to the description Herodotus provided of one of Sisistrisis' monuments. The carvings, which stand almost seven feet high, show a man with a spear in his right hand and a bow and arrows in his left, carved across his chest, running from shoulder to shoulder, and written in Egyptian hieroglyphs are these words, It was upon my shoulders that the winning of this land was born. 
it appears like we might have found the same exact spot where Herodotus once stood 2,000 years ago. It very nearly matches his description to a T. Well, almost. I hate to be a stickler, but excuse me, Herodotus, he holds the spear in his left hand and the bow in his right. The description is also not on his chest, it's over his left arm. But it's fine. Some scholars think Herodotus might have seen an extremely similar but separate relief located nearby, perhaps one of the ones that got destroyed in the 1970s or 80s. In any case, it's about as good as you can get the holy grail to fact-checking a Greek guy who's been dead for 2,000 years. Aw oh, man, Herodotus, are you scared? We got him. Oh, you're so done for, buddy. We have the guy, we have the hieroglyphics. Was Herodotus right? Well, for the longest time, travelers and early archaeologists in the 1800s assumed he was. But over time, more practice archaeologists began to call the Egyptian and Cisistrisis interpretation into question. Although superficially, the man in the relief could look like a pharaoh, he also looked far more like the warriors and kings found in similar reliefs carved by the Hittites, the native empire that ruled Anatolia, and were the sworn enemies of the Egyptians. But because nobody could translate the hieroglyphic language, there was no way to say for certain. When Egyptian hieroglyphics were finally cracked and translated by modern archaeologists, people realized that the hieroglyphics of the Karabel relief were not Egyptian at all. You're a phony! Contrary to what Herodotus said, they were, surprise surprise, in the language of the native Hittites, Luwian hieroglyphs. It took another hundred years, look, some things in archaeology are very, very slow, to finally crack and translate what these hieroglyphs actually said. Did they translate to the famous words of Cisistrisis? It was upon my shoulders that the winning of this land was born. Um, let's see, drumroll please. In 1998, Hittitologist David Hawkins rendered the three very damaged lines of the Carabao relief into English for the first time. It said, Tarkas Nawa, King of Miraland, son of Alan Tali, King of Miraland, grandson of... King of Miraland. Liar! That's not Sisistrisis. That's not what. Th who the hell is this Tarkas Nawa guy now? Well, his name was already known from several previously discovered artifacts. Probably the most significant was the so called Seal of Tarkas Nawas. The seal is crucially bilingual, spelling the king's name both in cuneiform and Hittite around his portrait. Ironically, this seal is part of the reason why we can translate the Hittite language in the first place, and by proxy Herodotus's mystery man. As the Karabo relief states, Tarkas Nawas, or Tarkas Nawa, was one of the kings of Mira, a relatively small kingdom in western Anatolia during the Late Bronze Age. He lived at a time roughly contemporaneous with Ramses II. It's entirely possible the two traded letters as pin pals, as was the custom at the time, but they definitely never met. I'm very sorry, Ramses II turned Tarkas Nawa shippers. Besides this, not much is known about him. The fact he had several reliefs and seals bearing his name and likeness suggests he was a long-lived and significant player in the region of western Anatolia. But in the grand scheme of history, he was a relatively obscure king of a small kingdom whose list of deeds and accomplishments have not survived. And not long after him, the kingdom of Mira was eventually incorporated into the Hittite Empire and largely forgotten. Tarkas Nawas wasn't a pharaoh, he wasn't Egyptian, and as far as we know he wasn't even that much of a conqueror. He has absolutely nothing to do with Sisistrisis and his story. Yet again, our man Herodotus seems to have screwed up. I'm tired of seeing this guy. Like with the Twin Pyramids, we should ask ourselves what exactly happened here that led Herodotus to write down something so wrong. Well, first off, Herodotus admitted that he was unable to read either Egyptian or Hittite hieroglyphics, so whenever he talked about these cultures, he was relying on guides. As far as the Carabel relief is concerned, it seems like Herodotus' translator also didn't know either language, and just made the whole thing up maybe on the spot. The Greek tourist, none the wiser, assumed the symbols were Egyptian due to the vague superficial similarities. Now, it's unclear if Herodotus visited the relief before or after he traveled to Egypt and subsequently learned about Cisistrisis. 
Maybe he saw it long before he learned the story, and only retroactively linked the two together. We will never know. In my opinion, Herodotus seems like he was overly trustworthy of the Egyptian priests. He apparently just accepted what they said was true, and tried to find any shred of evidence to support that preconceived idea. And when it comes to the story of Sisistrisis, the evidence was pretty tenuous and sketchy to begin with. But that doesn't answer where exactly the story came from. Who created this seemingly made-up pharaoh? And more importantly, why? Was it really just to troll some Greek guy they would never see again? Well, we will probably never know for sure, as the trickster or tricksters are 2,000 years long gone. But there are definitely theories on where the idea came from. It is possible that the pharaoh was created by merging several real pharaohs together into a single person, but this only explains so much. In my opinion, the most compelling explanation is that Sisistrisis was intentionally made up by someone as a piece of nationalistic Egyptian propaganda. It is important to stress the cultural context of Egypt at the time Herodotus was visiting. The kingdom had been very recently conquered by the Persian Empire and demoted to the level of satrapy. The new pharaohs of Egypt were foreigners, Persians, who had brutally taken over the country and subjugated its people by force. Even 80 years after the fact, the Egyptians still resented this enslavement within their own kingdom, a kingdom that had once been great in their own for thousands of years. They regularly attempted to rebel against the occupation. The legend of Sisistrisis was in a way a very appealing story for the Egyptians of this time. It claimed that Egypt was once as great and even greater than the current Persian Empire. Under this legendary pharaoh, all that Persia owned now once belonged to Egypt. Not only that, but Sisistrisis succeeded where the Persians had failed, outdoing them by conquering Arabia and parts of Europe. The story wasn't true, it was an invented history. But that didn't matter. The storytellers just wanted to claim they were once better than their current overlords. <laughs> Make Egypt great again. Furthermore, Sisistrisis himself appears to be the perfect ruler, the very model of the idealized king. Not only a great warrior and conqueror, but a great administrator of the lands under his rule. A super genius, a king many should strive to be like. And it's curious that the story of Sisistrisis appears to have changed over time. 400 years after Herodotus, Diodorus provides us with several new details about Sisistrisis and his life that the Egyptians of Herodotus' day hadn't told him. For example, Sisistrisis is given a childhood. In a reversal of what King Herod did at Jesus' birth, the father of Sisistrisis gathered together from over all Egypt the male children born on the same day and prescribed the same training and education for them all on the theory that those who had been reared in the closest companionship would be most loyal and most brave. In Diodorus' version, Sisistrisis becomes a warrior at a very young age, and doesn't just conquer parts of Africa, Asia, or Europe, but the whole world. At least the world known to the ancient Greeks. He crosses the Ganges River and subjugates all of India to the encircling ocean, the literal end of the earth to the ancient Greeks. Needless to say, that Egyptians never conquered India, but Diodorus's newer version of Sisistrisis is intriguing in a different way. Diodorus, or at least his sources, seem to have retroactively made the pharaoh far more like Alexander the Great, who coincidentally had conquered a very real empire similar in size to Sisistrisis's fictional one within the 400 years that had passed since Herodotus. Alexander the Great was actually hailed as the new Sisistrisis after his conquest of the Persian Empire and beyond. Details were seemingly added to the story to parallel Alexander, the new Sisistrisis, with the old, original Sisistrisis. Sisistrisis' new backstory of his father forming a group of boys his age to be raised and schooled together is literally the same exact thing Alexander the Great's dad did when forming the Companion Cavalry Division. The story was intentionally updated. Since the era of Herodotus, the world had changed. It was much bigger than he ever could have suspected, and new players on the world stage seemed to outshine the accomplishments of the old. Sisistrisis had to be made out to be even grander and greater to adjust to these new times. So what's the point? If it's all fake, why should we care about Sisistrisis, the greatest pharaoh that never existed? Well, for one thing, even if the story isn't true, 
For thousands of years, Greeks and Romans believed it to be. As I said before, Alexander, who almost definitely read Herodotus' book, was hailed as the new Sisistrisis. The fantastical pharaoh was no doubt an inspiration to the young king, and the story might have been a part of what inspired him to travel and conquer so far. Alexander actually did what Sisistrisis supposedly had done thousands of years before. He made the myth a reality, against all the odds. The idea that the whole world could be united under one king, one kingdom, was unheard of. Such an empire had not existed before. This was a time when much of the world was made up of small, petty kingdoms constantly at war. The legend of Sisistrisis did not seem possible. The pharaoh was more of an idea than a person. He was everything a king ought to be. He was the number one king of antiquity, until Alexander the Great came along. This glorious image of Sisistrisis became even more distorted as time went on, so that by the Middle Ages, things were a little kooky. The Alexander Romance is a fascinating read for anyone who wants to see a funhouse mirror version of real history. The book was written in late antiquity and revised many times during the medieval era. It was intended to be an accurate account of the life of Alexander the Great, but it is filled with a ton of bizarre legendary stories making it more fantasy than history. From Alexander and his soldiers fighting a giant enemy crab, to Alex flying into heaven on the backs of griffins, it is a trip. One adventure of the young king will be particularly fascinating to us. Alexander and his army march to the land where the gods dwelt. They see indistinct phantasms and flashes of lightning. Alexander was afraid at first, but waited to see what would happen next. Presently, he saw some men lying down with light flashing out of their eyes, as if from lamps. One of them said to him, Greetings, Alexander. Do you know who I am? I am Sisonkosis, the lord of the world. Yet I was not so fortunate as you. I, who subdued the whole world and enslaved so many races, am now without reputation. But you will be favored because you have founded, in Egypt, the city of Alexandria, which the gods love. Alexander enters the land where the gods dwell, and meets none other than Sisistrisis, here called Sisonkokis. After his death, he appears to become a lesser god of some sort, an immortal servant that serves the higher gods of this place. Alexander meeting him is obviously a bit of medieval fan fiction. Sisistrisis appears somewhat depressed in the tale. He greets Alexander, but is saddened by the fact that this new king has outshined him. Unlike Alexander, the old pharaoh is a great king without a lasting legacy. No matter how great he was, no matter how big his kingdom once was, he has been forgotten with time. In any case, Alexander uses this opportunity to ask the gods a single question. How many years have I left to live? Sisistrisis is the one who responds. It is best for a living man not to know when his end will come. As soon as he learns the hour of his death, from that moment on, he is as good as dead. But if he remains in ignorance, this helps him forget about his death, even though he must die one day. The city which you have founded will be famous the world over. Many kings will come to destroy it, but you will dwell in it, dead and yet not dead. The city you have founded will be your tomb. After hearing this speech, Alexander went out. The story of Sisistrisis is an odd and complex one. It took thousands of years and the work of countless scholars to truly gain closure on the mystery. In many ways, we are lucky to have been able to solve it with the pieces that survived to us. Without the survival of the one Carabel relief, we would probably never know what exactly Herodotus had seen and claimed was the legacy of an all-powerful, world-dominating pharaoh. That's why it saddens me to tell you that this relief has almost entirely disappeared from the earth. As if time itself hadn't done enough damage, in 2019, Turkish authorities revealed that half of it had been destroyed by persons unknown. In the early morning, the vandals had drilled into the rock, chipping away at the legs and body of Tarkas Nawa. When it was over, fragments of rock and dust were strewn beneath the weather-faded shape of the king. He had survived the Bronze Age collapse, the Persians and Alexander's army. He had survived the Romans, the Crusades, the Ottomans, and both world wars. 
only to be smashed by some random, nameless treasure hunters who found nothing but the loss of their dignity beneath. Such is the fate of the last remnant of the king who never was, the mistaken king, the lord of the world, and the lord of nothing, Sisistrisus. Dead, and yet not dead. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this installment of Trey the Explainer. See you next time.